The following coverage of the International Livestock Congress at the Calgary Stampede is brought to you by Haney Farms, your canola, corn, and cereal seed experts. Haneyfarms.com Okay, we're here on realagriculture.com at the International Livestock Congress with uh, Dennis Laycraft. Dennis is the Executive Vice President of the Canadian Cattlemen's Association. He's based out of Calgary. Welcome, Dennis. Okay, Dennis, let's start off. Uh, obviously, uh, Cool is in place. Mm -hmm. um, let's start by going backwards and looking. You know, in retrospect, uh, you know, one of the questions that I get lots from uh, producers is, you know, should we have been more aggressive or should we have taken a different tact in approaching uh, the potential of Cool? Well, I think there's probably two questions there's on a lot of producers' mind getting other markets open because one of the issues around them cool is our dependence on the U.S. market. And we've worked a great deal over the last three years to try and strengthen Canada's trade negotiation capacity. When all markets closed here, which we saw in 2003, they're a lot faster closing than they are reopening. Mm -hmm. And we know as a scientific rules and guidelines around BSE evolved. Unfortunately, various countries' rules lagged in that evolution. And you know, there's still countries, you've got China, you've got Korea, a number of major markets that still are completely closed to Canadian beef. Even though we should be selling all beef products uh, from all ages of cattle into those markets. And even if you had an undetermined level of risk, International guidelines still say you should be able to sell. And, uh, they were revised this past May, even over 30 month beef, providing it was boneless beef. So, Canada, in our, our view, had to increase that capacity. What we've heard from other countries is we're not there frequently enough. When I say we're not there, Government of Canada and our negotiators are not there frequently enough. We don't necessarily have the capacity to respond at a high enough level in every market as quickly as when opportunities present and you know, we were oh, several years ago recommending we take Korea to the WTO. Well, we're finally getting to that stage now. You're always better to negotiate if you can. A uh, WTO case can take a year and a half all the way up to we're dealing with the Europeans right now on the uh, ban on growth promotions. Well that was 96, 97 we got into that and we're finally maybe going to see some improvement in access to that market. It's not an easy way to necessarily make progress, but it's, it's crucial that uh, we do negotiate effectively. And if you look at some countries, and New Zealand is a really interesting example. They had a very small population, a few million people. But last year they were able to negotiate free trade agreements with China and 10 other Asian countries. That's over two and a half billion consumers last year. You know, we're looking at Colombia, Peru, Liechtenstein. So that's a pretty insignificant, and they're you know good customers. Don't take me wrong, but compared to just the sheer size of the Asian market, so in our mind, yeah, there were there was a need to put more resources and more energy towards that. Now, in terms of them, cool. A number of us, some of us, have been fighting it for over 20 years, but I'm told there's been a fight going on for over 40 years. Now, that's how long these issues have been around that. And unfortunately, in 2002, it got to the point where in Congress, they faced a farm bill where you had a choice. They had in there a ban on packer ownership, and someone had gotten in country of origin labeling provisions that were changed. And when it got to what they call conference, that's when the two houses disagree on the final wording, they would process to get agreement to get the farm bill to move forward, they said we, they, the trade off was they took the ban on packer ownership out and left country of origin. Well, that was 2002. Under the previous administration, they, for a number of reasons, basically let it sit there until uh, you saw in the midterm election the Democrats took over control of both houses. Then they started pushing on a new farm bill, they started working on uh, changes in a new law, a new country of origin labeling law, which was essentially passed, which forced uh, the uh, Department of Agriculture to finally bring into effect country of origin labeling. And that came into effect in September. 
Now we knew we were heading towards an election. There was a tremendous amount of, of effort to get them to change that rule. And they were still going through rulemaking. The way their process worked is called an interim final rule. So there was a whole bunch of comments going in. They were taking into the account those comments at the same time the, the rule was in effect. And that actually led to the final rule being published on March 16th. We took exception to it before the rule went into effect and we recommended to the government of Canada that we do take this to the WTO. Well, by December, we finally got agreement from our, the government of Canada to do that. So they uh, took that. The U.S. administration responded in your culture. In the final wording, there was a change made in there. Those familiar with the rule appreciate that they created a number of different categories in there that affected whether we're exporting feed or cattle or slaughter cattle. And they simplified that so that you could exchange the labeling between them, which allowed sort of one mix label, so you had really two categories as a result of that. Um, as that was about to come into effect, then the administration changed, they were potentially going to put a freeze on all the rules, and there was a decision that they would let that rule go ahead, but the Secretary of Agriculture then brought forward a letter to the U.S. industry indicating that he would like them to record every stage of production on each label. And with the threat that if they don't comply with that, he would look at further rulemaking. Well, in essence, that's a de facto rule. If you don't comply, I'll make you it. So then that led us back to where we were asked, should we start the WTO case again? It was started again, and we're in the mode right now where information is being gathered, and we're continuing to press forward with that. What is different and changed over a number of years is we looked at pre-BSC, we worked actively in the U.S., we were down there regularly. Following that is we became aware of how crucial it was to influence all of the decisions that are being made in Congress. We now spend over a million dollars a year on U.S. advocacy. We have hired some really top-notch experts, Jan, John Maswell being one of them, who attends close to 25 state meetings. And if you want to influence Washington, you have to start at the state level and work your way through there. So the world has changed a lot for us. Uh, we export uh, at times as much as 90% of our, our uh, export products to the U.S. And I think everyone recognizes now that to be engaged in that market, you really have to be engaged in the political system too.